So I would like Amina, who uh, teaches at the University of Dhaka. And Amina has a, had a very interesting history herself because she grew up in Lahore and her father was in the army. But then after the war broke out in March, uh, the War of Liberation, she, along with her father and her family, like so many other Bangladeshis who were in the army or the air force and who were posted here, they were taken to a camp in Kohat. And from Kohat, she was um, taken to another camp somewhere else in the Punjab, I think. Mandi Bahawati, And in spite of being in the camp, Amina did give her metric exams, right? And she passed. And when the movement of peoples began in 1974, then she and her family were taken to Bangladesh. So I think Amina is going to talk about 1971. That's a very central focus in the lives of people in Bangladesh. And, but I think she's going to talk about it from the perspective of the women whom she has interviewed as part of her uh, work that we did on the oral history of women's lives in 1971. Yeah, Amina. Thank you, Hamidabha. Uh, I find it uh, very strange sitting here, you know, almost so, after so many years and talking of 71. I find it very difficult also. And I think, you know, like me, who grew up as children, you know, my generation would say, when the Pakistan society as a whole would acknowledge what it had done to us. I never thought that I was this so bad about it. Anyhow, you know, like, as I pointed out, that I'm really grateful to Nikha that at least, and I feel very touched about that thing, at least that the women in Pakistan, they are acknowledging that what they have done to us. But we'll wait for that day when, you know, the whole society will acknowledge and recognize. Because somehow what we lost in 71, we never got it back. Never. I mean... It was just like a lost childhood. One never got back to that stage again. And I think that particular experience makes it much easier for me to critique a state, to critique nationalism, and to see, you know, like what, how destructive it has been and what it has done to human beings, how it has divided humanity. And when I talk of nationalism and when I critique the state and nation, I do it with a lot of responsibility and a lot of commitment on my part because I really do believe that these constructions, these ideologies have divided people so much. And you know, so it has caused so much misery to human beings just in the name of nation building and glorification of nation. And these are such, you know, uh, what I would say, such mass. You know, like when I use the term masculinized, I am using here, here, it over here from a very negative perspective that, you know, we have these notions of power, these notions of control, these notions of domination, glory of a nation, which only brings destruction and misery to people. And uh, that's why I say that, you know, you have, I have, I feel a kind of commitment and responsibility towards this whole notion and to, you know, today when I talk of 71, it is with much pain that I'm talking about it and I critique my own state as well. I'm critiquing the state of Bangladesh as well because what it has done to the rape victims after 1971, but I see it as a fallout of the ideology of nationalism and this whole process of nation building as we came to see it. Okay, I begin begin with the con contention, you know, like that the ideology of nationalism when it first emerged in Europe, uh, it was looked upon as a libertarian and a democratic force. Uh, but increasingly, uh, as Benedict Anderson points out, that it lost much of its libertarian and democratic impulses, and it came to be looked upon not as an ideology, but as a kind of kinship and as a kind of religion. And with this, uh, uh, you know, like uh, th this movement away from the ideology to uh, nationalism being looked upon as a religion or as a kinship, it is also implied uh, that uh, 
uh, transformation took place in the positioning of women within this particular construction and women came to be looked upon increasingly as the biological as well as cultural bearers of the nation and thus women you know in this construction women acquired a very sacrosanct position that they were regarded as the honor or lodger as we call it in bangla that is shame uh, you know something that is to be protected it, they became very sacrosanct and uh, so i'm i'm making this point very consciously that women were looked upon as sacrosanct as properties of the nation and the authenticity of the nation was considered very important that women needed to be protected and one needed to have a very authentic nation the purity of the nation the the nation was is not to be polluted and when i say this please put put into context the uh, that you know like women were looked upon as biological as well as cultural bearers of the nation so it did not allow any space or autonomy to the women as such rather they became property of the nation and uh, also we find that in this uh, uh, construction women have been exalted to very high position uh, homeland is looked upon as the motherland and uh, Uh, in bangla literature we find no dearth of poetry and you know dramas and uh, writings eulogizing the role of women but you know i i'll just refer to one bengali song which says amago tumi ghumao ekhon tomar chhele ra jegeche ar bhoy nei go mao it means there is no fear mother you can sleep now your sons are woken up today and they are going to protect you so i emphasize you know like on this particular uh, line because it's the mother who needs to be protected is the women who that which means the women needs to be protected and the and the boys you know chele ra they are being called upon to make the sacrifices it's not the daughters who are being called upon and why i am making this point because in the construction of citizenship as well we find that you know like making the ultimate sacrifice for the cause of the nation or the state is looked upon as the highest position or you know like this is the highest status that a citizen can acquire so in this construction you see that when boys or men are being called upon to make the sacrifices for the cause of the nation they are being exalted to a higher position of citizenship than women so this naturally puts the women to a subordinate position with the women and this strengthens the patriarchal system and the patriarchal values of the state and so it is therefore no wonder that the post 1971 bangladesh established established itself on very strong patriarchal notions the 1971 liberation war of bangladesh is regarded as one of the bloodiest wars in the history of human kind According to one estimate about 30 million people lost their lives in the war. The subsequent history and the narratives of the liberation war has glorified the sacrifices made by its people for the achievement of independence. This glorification which is part of the nation construction as I pointed out earlier however has a distinct male bias. The accounts of the war while accounting for the deaths do not have a list of the women who had died or were killed during the 9 month long war with pakistan in the category of shaheeds uh, only two women that to belonging to the intellectual group have been included rape is another weapon that has been used deliberately as a war time strategy since women are looked upon as the biological bearers of the nation through raping a woman the enemy attempts to pollute the nation thus a woman's body becomes the pawn in the wars that nations play uh for their glory in the process however become the women becomes the despised other most often rejected and unaccepted by her own people and family many such women are in search of a home today in bangladesh uh, susan brown miller has pointed out that about 200000 bengali women had been raped by pakistani soldiers in 1971 yet the 14 volumes of officially documented history of the liberation war carry only a few testimonies of rape it was generally felt that such details or evidences of rapes would only harm the women more so quite consciously and deliberately those were kept a secret in many instances the files containing the evidences were burned down 
the government has set up a rehabilitation many rehabilitation centers were uh, set up by the government and these were set up in di different districts for the rape victims but the whereabouts of their records is also unknown today no serious attempt has even been made to retrieve them Consequently, at present, no list of rape victims is available in Bangladesh. According to Malika Khan, who was in charge of a rehabilitation center in Dhaka, a doctor at the center had told her that during the first three months of 1972, 1,70,000 ,70 rape victims were aborted and more than 30,000 war babies were born. This list, however, is not an exhaustive one and excludes the most marginalized women. Most of the war babies were given up for adoption despite protests and pleading from their mothers. In this context, Nilema Ibrahim, who is a leading women activist of Bangladesh, she points out that she had called upon Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the father of the nation, to decide about the fate of these children. And she had pointed out that the mothers were not willing to give up their babies. And the, this was the response of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and I quote, Send the children who have no identity of their fathers abroad. Let the children of human beings grow up like proper human beings. Besides, I do not want to keep this polluted blood in this country. So, you know, I emphasize on this word polluted because as I pointed out that, need, that the authenticity of the nation has to be protected. And women as the cultural, as the biological bearers of the nation, you know, like they have to make these sacrifices to protect the authenticity or purity of the nation. So the woman loses all autonomy and space. She doesn't have any room, you know, like her voice is completely silenced. She doesn't have has any say in this construction. And I point out that the attitude of the father of the nation was only a reflection of the gendered attitude of the state and society. It only refines the privileged position of men in society and more importantly, the privileged position of men over women. So the voices of women who had suffered most during the nine months of liberation war were completely lost and silenced. The state never made any attempt or created any space for these women to rehabilitate themselves psychologically. Values of society meant values of men, where in order to grow up like proper human beings, one needed the identity of one's father. In other words, the much eulogized mother figure needs to be sanctified and legitimized by a man. The, this petrification of the state and society has further been strengthened by the citizenship laws of the state, where paternity is, ma is made the basis of, uh, of deciding upon the citizenship of a child. Susan Brown Miller also points out that the Bengali men were totally unprepared to accept these women. Even some of them were rejected by their own family members. In an attempt to elevate them and make them acceptable to the society, they were given the title of Birangona, which means war heroines, by the father of the nation. Such coinage, however, was resented by women forums at that time. It was resented because the title did not offer them anything. In other words, there was nothing beyond the title. Moreover, the expectations that the title Virangona would make them acceptable to the society did not really materialize. Instead, the women became marked. They became the other. Such exaltations therefore uh, held no meaning for the affected women. Now I quote uh, from a close friend of mine, you know, like who also lost her father during 1971 and who till today she can't, has not reconciled herself to this fact and she, she and she, she just can't come to Pakistan even today. She has been invited several times but she tells me quite openly that I can't just make, bring myself down to going over to Pakistan because she saw her father bleed to death. and. Uh, uh, I'm uh, talking of Meghna Guhotha and she point in this context she points out uh, despite official attempt to recognize the sufferings of these women by calling them Birangonas, the program for reintegrating these women into society turned into a marry them off campaign which misfired tragically tragically that is for the women few prospective bridegrooms stepped forward and those who did make uh, who did made it plain that they expected the government as father figure to present them with ha handsome dowries. 
and these you know uh, these findings have also have come out by a study that we have made uh, in you know which was sponsored by Ayn Shalish Kendro and the book has also come out in Bangla where several interviews have been taken of the rape victims as well as uh, of uh, the widows and uh, since the book is in Bangla we could not bring it here but hopefully it would be translated and it's titled Nari Rakatu that is with, uh, Women 71 and it is the first attempt I believe of, you know like uh, to, inter uh, to bring out the narratives of the women victims of 71. Now I bring, uh, now I move over to the two case studies that I did as part of the of this project, which was oral narrative history project that was carried on by the Ayn Shalish Kendra. And I talk of two war victims of 1971. Quite consciously, you know, I had taken up the two women victims from, nine, uh, uh, from the Chittagong Hill Tracks area. I pointed out earlier to you that uh, I am very critical of the Bangladesh state as well. Because what, uh, 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 you know, somehow the state and state, the hegemonic ideologies of uh, state and nationalism, we see them being reproduced over and over again. And uh, post-independent Bangladesh, as I pointed out, it did not create any space or rehabilitated the women. I mean, the women continue to remain marginalized. It's there in my paper, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, and uh, it also marginalized its minorities, especially uh, the, the hill people of Chittagong Hill Tracks. And we have had an insurgency for over two decades in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. And, uh, Somehow, you know, because the Chakma chief, he had flown over to West Pakistan at that time, so they were looked upon as collaborators of the Pakistan army, and we also, you know, defined them as the other. And I bring in this narrative, the narratives of these two women to, you know, it's, it's an attempt on the, on the part of the Bengali society, or especially Bengali women, to reintegrate them and to make the point that they were with us in 1971 and they had also suffered during the war. And during the course of my research, I was very surprised to find that between 400 to 500 women were raped in the Chittagong Hill Treks by the Pakistan army and its collaborators. But yet we continue to term the Hill people as collaborators of the Pakistan army. The first case is of Mohini Tripura. It's, a, it's not her real name because she is a rape victim, so I had to change the name. Mohini was raped by the Pakistan army in 1971. Rape, as it is well known today, constitutes an important and deliberate strategy in modern warfare. And most uh, during war time, most of the men go to the war front and it is the women who look after the family and also keep the world running for the children. The anime therefore deliberately attempts to break this world and thereby demoralize the men in the war front by violating their women. Um, um, women are considered to be the property and honor of men. Violating them means violating the honor of men who are the vanguards of the nation. In this context, very little consideration is given to the feeling of the victims, the women. And there is a deliberate attempt to hide or support the facts. The suppression on the part of the society is however valorized as a noble act, an attempt to protect the lodger, that is shame of the girl or women, and indeed the entire shamaj, that is the society. This was evident when I went to interview Mohini Tripura in Khagrapur in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Khagrapur again is a false name that I am using using for the area. I had been told that about 400 to 500 women had been violated in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, but I was able to identify and talk to only one woman, that is Mohini, that too probably because she's a poor woman and has no guardian as such. I had informed the local union Purisha chairman of my arrival and you know why I want to interview Mohini much ahead of time and requested him to talk to her about my work earlier so that she could at least be mentally prepared to talk to me. But when I arrived there, I was told by the chairman that, you know, as he accompanied me to her house, he told me that he had not talked to her earlier because he did not know what to do about it. He did not know how to place it to Mohini. The chairman looked very disturbed and embarrassed as we approached the village. It was evident to me that he was reckoning with himself. He first spoke to the son of the 
uh, Vipcha Mat of Mohini since they were speaking in the Tripuri language so I could not follow their conversation but it was evident from his expression that he was very uncomfortable. Uh, the son continued to give me very hostile looks. After much prodding by the chairman he agreed to let me talk to his mother. The hesitation of the two men, though indeed she was the mother of one, reveals how the society, even the family, silences the victims. At first glance, I took Mohini to be around 70, but later discovered that she was only 56. Indeed, trauma and, po and poverty had taken its toll on her. She looked visibly disturbed and it was obvious that she, did, that she did not want to talk to me. But then I sat beside her on the floor as she did not have anything to offer me to sit on. It was only that then that she relaxed a little bit and started narrating her story of 71. In 1971, she lived in the same village with her with one son, with her one son and four daughters. Her husband used to do business in Tripura. He never took much care of them and did not come back after 1971. It was the rainy season. They had come in the morning. There were two or three of the Pathans. Pathans is a term which is used by the hill people to describe the Pakistan army. The Mizus were also with them. They had wanted to kill her son, but he ran off. Her three daughters also ran off. She was left alone in the house with her one-year-old daughter who was in her arms. She did not run off, for she felt that she had to protect the house for her children. This was where they belonged, and their home was their world. This was their only possession in the world. The house was the only security for her and her children. You know, Aiki, uh, why I am emphasizing on the word house? Because this is how she had put up this to me that this was the only possession I had to protect it for my children this was our only security she kept on repeating this to me the Pathans entered the house while the Mizos stayed outside the later uh, you know, the Mizos destroyed her banana and papaya trees the Pathans did not hurt her child but they assaulted her at that point I asked her what kind of assault it was she looked very disturbed and only said that they had hurt her she did not go into details. So she, she gave me a very disturbed and a very distant look. And she said that they had hurt me. They had hurt me. She kept on repeating that. She didn't go into the details of that. It was obvious that she did not want to remember it. And I wanted to finish the conversation as soon as possible. She never, And she told me that she had never talked of this incident to anyone. In fact, after a long silence of 26 years, she had opened up to me. She pointed out that the incident had changed her life. She was traumatized and still faints off when she remembers it. She often dreams about it, but in her dreams, their faces become very hazy. I'm talking of the, her violators. You know, their faces, they become very hazy. But she remembers them distinctly and sees them with her inner eyes. This is indicative of the struggle that is still going on within her. On the one hand, there is an attempt to forget the appearances of hazy faces is suggestive of this. At least I interpret it that way. Maybe Urbushi, Urbushi who also has done uh, many cases on such uh, on narrative, she might give me a different interpretation. But this is how I look at it. That, uh, you know, like uh, she's trying to resolve it uh, um, within herself. And she has almost entirely internalized it. That's why she sees them with her inner eyes. She suffers from insomnia as well. She pointed out that she does not want to think about it, so she keeps herself busy with her work and grandchildren. She never went to anyone for consolation. Rather, she consoled herself by looking after her children. She knew that she had to lead a normal life for the sake of her children. They were the source of her strength. Though Mohini did not blame anyone for the incident, but she appeared very bitter about the fact that such a fate had befallen her for no fault of hers. She said that she was in no way involved with the war. She had not supported the Mukti Bahini in any way. Rather, quite sadly, she posed to me the question that how could she involve herself with the war when she herself was involved in a war with life, with her struggle with, with poverty and survival? Uh, 
so you know this is how you know that's why i said that how in the glory how we try to construct nations how you know this nation construction this glorification is so distant and so far away for the from the lives of the common people like when she posed to me this question that i i myself was involved in with in a war with life i was struggling with my children how could i be involved in a war like that and why did such a thing happen to me and then i tried to talk to her son who was a young boy of 14 in 1971 but he simply narrated the fact that the military had damaged their trees and beat him beaten him up he further said that he said that his three sisters had run away and their mother was left alone in the house with their one year old sister he did not talk about any physical assault on his mother the neighbors also refused to talk about it they categorically pointed out to me that they had never asked her any questions nor raised the issue with her at the conventional level one might argue that the society had acted in favor of mohini it has protected her by not making an issue out of the incidents at a more fundamental level however one might have raised the question that the society did not really protect her or was it protect it was in fact protecting itself and its own values in a society where women are regarded as the pro- property of man any violation of women is looked upon as a failure of the men especially if the violator is the enemy uh, so and if the violator is the enemy then the, it is regarded also as a failure of the nation and such failures a nation is of course uh, still unprepared to accept uh so uh, so we find that the society has silenced the voice of mohini and uh, but i would argue here that mohini in fact was the protector of the nation because she was protecting the home for her children and uh, uh, you know like uh, she was protecting the home and home ultimately is the homeland you know it's a continue if you look at it, it that way it's a continuation of the you know like uh, the home constitutes the at the micro level you know when we talk of homeland a, a person ultimately comes back to the home so it's the woman who is actually protecting the nation not the man but uh, in the dominant discourse we look upon the men as the protectors of nation so one has to look at it from that perspective as well so i talk of another war victim now she's birangona chakma but and this is her real name uh, she lost her husband in 1971 Birangona's husband was killed by the Pakistan army. Death for motherland is regarded as a supreme sacrifice. Unlike the cases of rape there is a willingness to talk. When I entered the house of Birangona Chakma I found her sitting in the living room. On the wall was a framed picture of her late husband Chittaranjan Chakma. Birangona is an old woman of around 75. She lives today with her son Dr. Shudhin Kumar Chakma who teaches in the Khagra Chori College. Birangona pointed at the picture on the wall and with a deep sigh told me that it was her late husband who at that who at the time of the incidents was 53 years old though she looked sad and disturbed but she was most willing to talk so see the difference between mohini and tripura i can't even use the real name of mohini but birangona insisted that i use her name birangona narrated to me the events of 13th may 1971 the day the day her husband was taken from the house by the pakistan army she went into the details of the day she recalled that at the time of the incident she herself her younger son shudhin kumar chakma his wife konika chakma elder daughter omita chakma and son in law kala cham chakma and the youngest daughter shunchita chakma were present in the house on the day at around 7 pm an, an army man came to their house at that time they were offering prayers to lord buddha chitranjan and his son shudhin was standing in the courtyard Chitturanjan had uh, his hookah in his hand the man asked for a glass of water see how she remembers all the details konika was busy cooking dinner for the family shudin brought the glass of water from her after drinking water the army 
men he asked chitaranjan to accompany him this he uh, chitaranjan did without any protest the whole family was in a state of shock shunchita the youngest daughter had already hidden herself in a nearby field along with her brother in law shudhin also left the house and went into hiding shunchita returned at around 9 pm it was decided that konika and shunchita would leave the house and stay with their relatives for some time it was feared that the army might come back again birango na however was adam and she had stayed back alone according to her she had felt that it was her husband's house and she had to protect it for her children birangona then narrated to me that how on the next day the local enemies had come and informed her of the death of her husband these people told her that you know like when her husband was taken by the army they in the first had beaten him him up in the market place then they took him away they had and uh, her husband was a so- supporter of the awami league and according to her sh- her husband had helped zia rahman to cross you must have heard about zia rahman who later became the ruler you know like he was one of the commanders that her husband had uh, uh, you know help her help zia rahman to cross over to india but this is also but you know this statement that her husband has helped zia rahman to cross over india has been contested by the other hill people but i am stating this because this is what she told me that uh, and then she told me that uh, the army tried to you know make her husband talk but he kept quiet then they kicked him on in his stomach and they shot him in, in his stomach and they said that you have hidden many things in your stomach and they shot him also in his tongue because he was not speaking that's how he died you know this is how uh the local enemies had narrated to, uh, this to him and these local enemies they, she said that they were collaborators of the pakistan army and i went back to those people you know whom she had accused of you know collaborating with the pakistan army but they denied it they said no this was not true but she told me that these uh, uh, that they were also tried afterwards these people were tried and they were given like j- jail terms as well so these local enemies they even want her not to tell of this to anyone or perform any religious ceremonies for the dead persons else the, else the same fate would befall her family members she bore the sorrow and burden all by herself shudin had gone you know her, her eldest son shudin had gone into hiding and did and did not have any contacts with the family for the next six months konika and shunchita had gone to stay with their relatives birangona was alone in the house for six months during this time according to her she took took care of the house prayed for her late husband and children most importantly she felt that she had to take care of the books of her children she pointed out that at that time her eldest son was doing was doing his phd in london and her husband had all along wanted that the children should get get the best of education and according to her this was the cause of his death because many people had become jealous of their family and uh, um so uh, this is how she you know she told me that she took care of the book of her children because the the books she felt were so integral to her family to her husband to her children and uh, today she continues to live with her son though though they take very good care of her yet she feels that her freedom had been curtailed she missed her home and her husband in essence she looks back at 71 with a sense of la- loss and sadness biranguna today finds solace for her loss by looking after her gr- grandchildren she is not bitter and, and considers that it was fated to be like this more importantly she believes that god has punished the wrong doers so she does not hold any vengeance against anyone so you know like uh, in, in the two cases that i did i found it uh, that somehow there was no bitterness among the women i mean there was kind of a surrender to fate they thought that this uh, this was fated for them and uh, they left they thought that you know god would one day uh, take a river, uh, you know god would avenge uh, uh, you know for what her fate had befallen them so that's why when i pointed out that you know like we in bangladesh are waiting today for uh, for the day when the pakistan society as a whole would acknowledge and recognize for what they had done to us in 71 maybe in some way they would find some solace and comfort in that but i don't know whether 
for Mohini or for Benango night, would, uh, they would have, you know, lived to see that day. Uh, or they would even understand, you know, what it means to them. But at least one can say that uh, a beginning had been made. And, uh, you know, for many of, you know, like who grew up, like for someone like Meghna, who is such a close friend of mine who lost her father, she would never get back her father. But at least, you know, like a, at least one can say that that arrogance is not there. You know, one recognizes that one uh, that a wrong had been done. That's all I can say today. Thanks. <laughs>